So, Pastor Rob, tell me about your church. Dre, this is honestly the best church I've ever passed. I love it. I've got a phenomenal group of people. I got people from every walk of life, every color, every race. When I came here, I said, God, I don't want a white church. I, want a, I don't want a black church. I don't want a brown church. And so he gave me a multicultural church, and it's multi-generational. To me, it fits the God so loved the world. It's everybody. Uh, and, you know, that's what makes me interested in stories like yours. Here you are. You grew up in Clearwood, uh, gang-banging and uh, doing drugs, crazy life, a dangerous life. And yet, why was it you just, just couldn't stop and leave it? Mm. Perception. You know, if I was to hand you the cell phone and tell you to fix it, you will look it over and you will say, there's nothing wrong with it. That's how my reality was. Growing up in the streets, you see drugs, you see violence, you see all this stuff going on, and that's the norm. That's your reality. That's, your, that's how you perceive life. And until you can see that there is something wrong with something, then you won't fix it. And so that's what Jesus did for me. When Jesus came into my life and, and gave me a different perception, mm. a different perspective, I didn't want to rob people. I right. didn't want to sell drugs. I didn't want to do those things, and I recognized them as being wrong. But it wasn't until Jesus came into my life that I seen that the way that I perceived life was wrong. Wow. So simply put, you can't fix something you don't know is broke. Definitely. Awesome. Hello, it's Mr. Blessing, highly favored, the one Jesus love. Shots out to my maker, brought me out the hood and labeled me righteous. Then he told me that I was made in his likeness, gave me a new heart, the mind was so callous. Shooting for the stars, yeah, the boat was so Dallas. Sinner by nature, I was so malice. You say, oh God, good, mine came out the palace. Some call him Christ, some call him Lord. He is my hope that comes from above. God Almighty, my Redeemer. Welcome with me, Dre! <laughs> hey, brother. <laughs> hey, man. God bless you. Thank you too, brother. So good to have you. Well, I'm going to tell you all something about Dre that none of you would ever, ever guess by just looking at him. We actually are more than just kindred spirits. You're part Italian. Yes. Yes. <laughs> your, your grandma was half Italian. Yes. And your mom is quarter Italian. Yes. 
and you're one-eighth Italian. Yes. <laughs> so he's my brother from another grandmother. <laughs> Uh, so good to have you here, dude. Uh, listen, you have an incredible story. I've heard a lot of messed up lives, and yours is right up there. But what's incredible is that nothing is too hard for God. Amen. And he loves all of us enough to come down to where we are. See, religion will tell you You've got to climb the ladder and get up to where God is. But the truth, the gospel, God says, no, I'm going to come down to where you are. And so, uh, Dre, um, you know, one of the things that stuck out to me, we're going to start from the very beginning of your story and just let it unfold so everybody can understand where you've come from and what's happened and this amazing grace. You know, we have a saying here, grace takes you from where you are and faith will take you to where you've never been. And that really pretty much sums up your life. Definitely, definitely. Now, how old were you when your biological mother first abandoned you? Two. You were two years old? Yes. Okay. And uh, that was your biological mother. So what happened from there? Who took you? Where... Where was your dad? What, what happened? So my dad was one of those guys, multiple women, and um, he was living with his wife at the time. Um, social services came to pick me up, and he kind of got there before they got there, and they allowed him to take me. And so I went and lived with his wife and him for, uh, for the rest. So two years old, you really didn't know what was going down? Not at all. As far as you knew, this was your family? Yes. Did they treat you like family? Um, not everybody. Not, not everybody. everybody. Not at all. What happened? Um, so growing up, my family made it clear to me that I wasn't any kin to them, that they did not like me. Uh, my sister uh, from my stepmom, um, She just, she hated me. She started having kids. I couldn't touch her kids. I couldn't play with her kids. I couldn't come near her. Um, Multiple people in the family at any given time would tell me, hey, my mom is not my brother's. My mom is not your mom. My aunt is not your mom. You're not in the kin to us. And like I said, I I didn't know, so I didn't understand why my family was saying these things. Crazy, crazy. And uh, Dre, um, how old were you when you actually found out? your situation. I was 12. And, and how did that make you feel? It broke me. It, it broke me because it made everything up until that point make sense. You know, this is why I'm treated this way. This is why I feel this way. And um, it really, it, it was a switch turn for me. You know, it hurt it, the fact that the woman who I thought was my mom wasn't my mom. And no matter how much I desired, no matter how much I wanted it, she wasn't my mom. Okay. We're having a technical difficulty. I apologize. Uh, your head mic's playing up, and we're going we're gonna to go with the... Shall we take the handheld that he sang with? Just keep talking? All right. Dre, I'm going to ask you that again for the sake of... Um, because we are videoing this. Uh, this is such a unique story. So uh, two years old... You get brought to your father's house, his actual wife. Your mom was just one of his uh, girlfriends, right? And so your, your stepmom takes you in, but you were abused quite a bit uh, and told that they didn't really want you. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Okay. And uh, I'm going to give you this mic. <clears throat> All right. I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> so you were rejected by the rest of your family. They told you you weren't kin, you weren't family with them. Yes. And so as a little boy growing up, you, you had no idea what they were talking about. No, I didn't, I didn't understand why they were saying that. And any time they did say it, my mom would say, that is my son. Stop saying that. Stop saying that to him. That is my son. But I never knew, I had never had an understanding of why they said it, you know. And at what age did the reality come to you? Who told you and how old were you? So I was 12, remember like it was yesterday, I get off the bus, my mom's sitting on the porch, she looks, you know, distraught like something's really wrong. She say, I need to talk to your son. Um, she sat me down, told me how much she loved me, uh, and no matter what, she loved me. 
And um, she proceeded to tell me that I wasn't her real mom, you know, that she wasn't my real mom. And um, she kind of told me the story how my mom abandoned me and left me and how she got me. And it, I didn't understand it. It, it didn't make sense, you know. I, didn't, I, didn't, I couldn't perceive what she was saying because it didn't make sense, you know. What do you mean you're not my mom, you know? And so she told me, you know, I'm not your mom, not your biological, I'm not your biological mom, but I am your mom. And it, and it really broke me, you know, and she just told me, you have an option. You can either call me, you know, by my name or you can call me mom. That's your decision. And so I chose to call her mom because I didn't know any other mom. So finally now in your head, how old were you when you heard this news? Twelve. Twelve years old. Yes. And you're starting to put together why everybody was dissing on you while everybody was saying you're not family, you're not kin, and treating you as harshly as they did. Now, you shared something with me that is very, very private, but you said you're okay to share it. Uh, and that was that from a very young age, one of your cousins was messing with you. Explain that to everybody. What was going on? So, um, first off, I was abused um, by my aunt, physically abused, verbally abused on multiple occasions. She used to twist my ears. She used to call me ugly, stupid, dumb, make me stand in a corner for long periods of a time, beat me for no reason, um, just made me really feel small. And when I was eight years old, I was sexually abused by one of my cousins. And um, it was, it was hard, you know, it was tough and it, and it really confused me and, and really made me angry and afraid. I was afraid to say anything. I didn't know what to say. And, um, and so I just didn't say anything and just, it repeatedly happened for years, and I was just afraid to say anything to anybody. That started when you were eight years old. This yes. was a male cousin. Yes. How long did that go on for? Till I was about 16. Wow. And, and you know, the reason why, you know, when you told me this the other day, number one, it creates deep-rooted anger and resentment, together with all the other garbage that you've experienced in your life. But my ears pricked up purposely because... This is way more common than what people realize. And this is the type of thing that men aren't going to talk about. They're not going to tell you that they were sexually molested, especially by another fellow. And yet, there's no rhyme or reason. And inside of us, there's the anger, there's the hate. All of this stuff is just surging, and we're livid and probably don't understand completely why we're as angry as we are. Now, you told me they had a nickname for you at your mother's church. Yes. What was that? The little angry boy. That was, that was my nickname. Anytime somebody preferred to me, they would say, you know, the little angry boy, the one that's always angry all the time. And were you the little angry boy? I was. My whole entire life, I, I was angry. I, I had rage that was just uncontrollable. Um, and it didn't take much. I, I, um, I, my whole entire life, I felt like I've had, especially as a child, I felt like I've had a person inside of me, a little boy inside of me screaming, and nobody can see but me. Nobody knew. Nobody can hear him. And he's always screaming. Nobody ever hugged that little boy? No. Nobody ever cared about that little boy? No. So from two years old, you're experiencing rejection and abandonment. Your mom just laughed. Yes. And, and, and social services had to come and get you. Yes. Right? And then you're put into this other family while you may not cognitively have understood everything that was going on at, at the time, uh, a life during that period of constant abuse, verbal, physical, and then even sexual. And then you go to church and you're just labeled the angry little boy. Yes. Uh, I'm sure you just uh, felt inspired when they called you the angry little boy. Yeah, I hated church. You hated church. And I, hated church. I don't blame you. And I, I, I apologize that sometimes people act less than what God saved us from and less than what God saved us to. It's one thing that God will save us from our sin, but we need to get a revelation of what God has saved us to. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. So at what age did you personally start doing drugs? How did your life unfold from that point? Um, so I, when I found that out, um, it, I told myself nobody was ever going to hurt me again after that. Um, and I, so I just took my anger and my rage, and I took it out on more 
anybody possible. Um, preferably people, bullies. I hated bullies, and it was a perfect opportunity. Um, I couldn't protect myself at home, and so when I went to school, I just looked for the, the, the kid that couldn't protect himself and who was bothering him, and I just took my rage out on everybody at school. I was constantly getting fights in school, constantly getting, um, getting, kick, getting kicked out of class, constantly getting put in the principal's office, constantly, and just every, every, every day in school. I don't think it was a day I didn't get a referral, a day I didn't get a write-up. Now, this anger and rage was so real, they ended up putting you in special ed classes. Yes, when I was in second grade, my teacher told my mom that I wasn't learning at the same rate as the rest of the kids, and my anger was so bad that I could not remain in um, regular classes. And so how did that affect you going forward? What advantages or disadvantages came into your life as a result of being labeled special ed? Um, it made me feel less than. Um, I, I never felt like I was slow. I never felt like I was special or I needed special ed. And so when you you put me in a classroom, you put me in a room full of people who you label special. And make, I'm okay. If I'm special, I'm gonna act special, you know. And it made me feel like there was something wrong with me. So you acted out out of that all the more. Yes. Now something in particular happened that uh, you were good with track, right? Yes. And but. You, you were sort of offered a, a scholarship or something? So it wasn't necessarily a scholarship. So I, when I was, a, I ran track and played football and uh, I, was a, I was a pretty good sprinter. And I got a letter from Middle Tennessee University to, to apply for their school. Um, my, my coach had set it up. My coach had big connections and she kind of set it up. And so all I had to do was apply and get accepted and it, it was, open door. And that sense. would have been a pretty high point for you, right? Yes, yes. I mean, yes. here's a, an opportunity to prove, to establish yourself what validation you could get out of this hellhole. What happened? I applied and um, I was rejected. Um, they said because I was in special ed classes. And so I go talk to my guidance counselor and she explained to me, she said, Mr. Bonnie, over the last 12 years, you, you've accumulated the education of a sixth grader. And um, so I, I just kept getting passed and passed, you know, each class, just passing me to the next class, but never really giving me a full education. So here you are, abandoned at the age of two, no fault of your own. Your mom used to just go from place to place, hardly ever settled anywhere. You end up in a step family that hates you, abuses you, misuses you, physically beats you, sexually abused you. And you go to a church and you're constantly being told you're that angry little boy. So you end up in special ed education labeled and uh, never get a proper uh, education. And your big break finally comes and something invisible is there to take it away from you. Yes. What went through your mind? What went through your heart? So... I never thought I would be anything. Um, I never thought I would make it out. Um, you know, most people, you, you, you grow up and you know you're gonna own your own house one day. You know that, you know, you're gonna get a car and you're gonna, you're gonna do these normal things that's normal. And so, in reality, that's, 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 that can happen. All I gotta do is grow up, you know, get a job, start working, I own a house. I can do this, I can do that. Um, and so for me, making it out of the hood, um, it was like equivalent of winning a lottery, like it's not gonna happen. Um, owning my own home, it's not gonna happen. Um, being successful, being somebody of anything, it's not gonna happen. Um, I didn't think I was gonna reach, make it past the age of 25. So when that happened, it was like life once again saying, I told you, you're never gonna be anything, you're never gonna amount to nothing. Stop trying. You uh, had someone that you looked up to. Yes. And when you graduated, who was this person and uh, what happened? He came and paid you a visit. What happened? Yes, yeah, so uh, a guy who I looked up into and respected in my community was a big-time drug dealer. And um, when I graduated high school, he pulled up on me in a um, brand-new 745 and told me to get in the car. Um, told me that I was smart, that I wasn't like the other kids on the block and he wanted me to work for him. So this is probably the first time somebody's giving you some validation. He actually told you you were smart. Yes. How did you feel when he told you you were smart? <laughs> it was everything, especially coming from him, because I respected him so much, and his words meant carry weight to me. 
I can't, I can't even begin to fathom. I'm sorry. You know, growing up so void of validation, so void of what should be common to every one of us, a mother's love, affection, a brother's love, uh, and here you have to hear from a major drug dealer in Clearwater, you're not dumb, you're not stupid, you're special, you're smart, I want you to work for me. Yes. So what happened from there? So I started working for him um, for a little while until I, I made enough money to buy my own drugs, and I just dove off headfirst into the drug world, um, mainly because... You know, in the, in the streets, I try to tell people, you got two different perspectives. You have, in Clearwater, for example, you have Clearwater as a huge city, but then you got the North Greenwood area. Now, that is two cities in one city. North Greenwood, yes. that's where you hailed from. Yes, and those, that's two, you know, Clearwater is two cities to me. You got Clearwater, and then you got North Greenwood, and the rules don't apply to those. So the only place that I felt that I could be anybody was in that area. That was my world, and the only thing that mattered was that world. And so in the streets, we have this term called hood rich. And, we, and that, that term comes from perspective of getting a job, living a normal life, that's not for people like us. People like us, our respect is only in this community. How people view us is in this community, and that's the only thing that matters. Outside of that doesn't matter. So. How people in this community respect me, how they view me, how they see me, gives me significance. So, in other words, uh, hood rich. You're not going to be rich like anybody else. Your only way of being rich is by definition of life as defined by the hood. Yes, money. It's all about money. You got money, you got respect, you got power. Now, w w with all of this here, I, and I believe the drug dealer gave you your first bag of crack and said to start selling that. Um, Is that correct? Was it crack? Yeah, but he, he, I, mean, he was, I was already selling drugs at that point. Um, he just gave me drugs on a, on a, on a different scale. On a different scale. Yes. Okay. So um, you shared something with me that I thought was absolutely crazy, and most, you know, Modern America could not equate to this. What did you expect your life expectancy to be? The goal was to reach 25. 25. Yes. That was the goal. Yes. And why 25? Because most, most guys, they don't, they don't make it past 21. It's lucky to see 21. And so to my, one of my goals and dreams was I wanted to know what it was like to become a man. And I was so afraid that I was never going to get to grow up and actually be a man because, I mean, most of my friends, everybody's getting murdered, you know? And it's, that's, it's every day. It's like, I, you know, today I might get murdered. That's the reality. Do you understand this is Clearwater. Clearwater, Tampa Bay, the city that's listed as probably always being in the top 10 beaches in the United States. This is where everybody else comes for vacation, spring break. This is that awesome, incredible place, Clearwater. But there were two cities, really, a city within a city, your place. And here you are, if you lived to 25, you arrived. That was incredible. You would have outlived most of your friends. Yes. That is crazy. That is absolutely crazy. So you were doing drugs. Were you in a gang? Yes, I started gang banging when I was 16. Now, again, I did this to you the other day. You and I, we were talking, and the white in me started coming out. I said, okay. <laughs> Explain to me exactly what does gang banging mean? Does it mean just hanging out with the gang? No, it means um, beefing, fighting, shooting, brawling with other gang members or anybody else that came up against. So other face. gangs, they were your rivals. They weren't even your brothers. They were just your rivals. Yes. So your term for what I thought was gang banging, gangs just hanging out, you know, their definition of cool, gang banging is one gang shooting up another gang and robbing from them. Yes, banging means fighting. So it's gangs banging against other gangs. And that was life. Yes. And uh, most of your friends, are they alive today? Um, not necessarily, no. 
there's a lot is alive, but there's a lot is dead. And not and you know, not from not from old age. Not what? Not from old age. Not from old age. No. So they've been shot dead? Yes, all of them. Wow. And some of them dead from drug use? Um, no. Just, really? Just murders. Just murdered? Just murders. This is why we need to be more than just the church that meets inside of buildings, hey? That's why we need revival. In the middle of uh, an incredible holiday destination, there's a world that you and I don't see where a young kid is abandoned from the age of two and his big dream is to try to stay alive till he's 25 so he could experience what it feels like to be a man. That is insane. Now, <clears throat> um, you had a situation where um, you were offered the opportunity to join a, a gang from out of state. Yes. Tell us about that. What was the name of the gang, if you're allowed to say, and what were you required to do? So the same guy who gave me the drugs, his um, girlfriend, cousin, um, was a blood from Virginia. And um, he was on a run for a couple murders, and so he came to Clearwater. And he introduced us to him. And uh, after we got to know him for a while, he, um, he really respected us. He really respected the... Uh, the realness in the, in a in a street way, um, and he wanted us to be part of the Bloods, and so part of being that he put us on the phone with his, um, his leader, and he told us told him about us and how we was, and he told us he had respect for us, and he heard good things about us, and he wanted us to come up to Virginia and get blooded in. Um, get blooded in. Yes. That's initiation into that particular gang. Yes. And, and, and so they talk about respect. You, you had honor in that circle. Uh, what gains you respect in that world? Um, your reputation, uh, fighting, um, how, how I, you I'm sure yourself. that you were a quarter or one-eighth Italian probably took you a long way, right? They <laughs> said, so this guy's got mafia right in him. I, I told Dre, I said, dude, if you're Italian, you must come from Sicily because they're darker down there. <laughs> I love you, man. You're a good guy. <laughs> so they, they talked to you about getting blooded in. You had honor on the streets. There was, what would they consider honor? Why, why would this guy speak well of you to the head? And so at, so at the time he was coming, we was heavy involved in, in gangs. And he seen the respect we had. He's seen, he's, he's been there for a couple fights. He, he heard about everything that we had been doing, and he respected that. You know, the, um, so the violence, the, the fighting, uh, all of that is what gained you respect in that world. Yes. What did you have to do? Did you join the Bloods? What did you have to do to join I the Bloods? Um, I didn't. Me and my brother were both offered what we was told that we had to come to Virginia and just kill a random person. And um, just like not a, not another gang member, not some violent, crazy person, a random person. Just a random person on the streets. You had to have the guts or the whatever it is that it takes in their eyes to walk up to an absolute stranger and shoot them cold-blooded murder right there in the street for no other reason so that you could be accepted in a gang. Yeah, because if you kill a random person, you kill anybody. Now, next week, we have a guest coming here. His name is Tony Davis, and he was actually the victim of a, a gang initiation, and some young fella wanted to join a gang, and he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they emptied five bullets into him. Every bullet entered and exited, left 10 holes in his body, and he bled to death. That's what you were supposed to do. Yes. And did you go ahead with that? I didn't. Why? 
that's not who I was in, inside, in spite of, um, yeah. <clears throat> despite of all the, all the gangs and the violence and everything I did, just killing some random person, just, that's not who I was. Good on you, buddy. I appreciate that. How did you get out of Clearwater? What happened? Um, I was short, long story short, I was sitting at home. I kept getting these desires to want to change my life, desires to want to make it out, desires to do something different. And so I kept acting on those desires. I went and filled out applications. I kept trying to do something to try to change my life. And I was sitting at home one day smoking weed and a commercial came on TV for Universal Technical Institute. And I was just like, let me call these people. And I, was, I picked up the phone, called them, talked to the lady, and she was just gave her all my information. And she was like, well, Mr. Bonnie, you accept it. You can start school in August. <laughs> and what did you think? Somebody's pulling my leg. Yeah, I was like, it was that easy? I didn't know it was that easy. You know, I didn't know it was that easy. The street guy in you, did you feel like somebody was conning you? Yeah, I, I had to ask her a couple of times, was she joking, you know? <laughs> so what happened? You joined the school. Where was the school? In Houston, Texas. Okay. And so I, um, I packed up and I moved to Houston. And that was to learn what trade? Um, body, um, learn how to do body work on car. And body work and spray painting? Yeah, spray painting, said? spray painting cars. Okay. So how did that work out for you? Was that your ticket? Is that why you're here today? What happened? No. So I get to school, and um, my first class teacher happens to be a Christian. And he shared the gospel with us in class when he wasn't supposed to. You know, I, I'm going to pause there for a second. Church doesn't happen here. This building doesn't constitute church. You, washed with the blood of Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you, you are church. You are the church. And Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against you, the church. Religion makes this building and this order of service ceremony, they call it church. That's never what the Bible called church. In the New Testament, the church is every born-again person, every person who had a one-on-one -on -one encounter experience with Jesus Christ. We are the church. And God says all the forces of darkness that are in this world, all the forces of darkness that manipulate kingdoms and rules and nations doesn't have power to subdue us or to stop us. So here's some guy, yeah, here's some guy just like all of you out there, he understood he was the church. And here he is lecturing, teaching you and talking and sharing his faith about Jesus Christ. Dude, what did that do to you? It showed me, I, I, my whole life I thought I was a Christian because... Whoa, 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 whoa. That is messed up. But you've told me this before. That a lot of the drug dealers and stuff like that, one of your friends came out of jail and after you really got straight, you talked to him and tried to witness him. And, and what did he say to you? Yeah, so one of my friends is um, what we call in the streets, we call a jack boy, which means he robbed other drug dealers. For He's a, a jack boy? Yes. And, and, so, and that means he robs other drug dealers. Yes. He's going to be a dead boy. <laughs> Jack boy. Okay, yeah. and so he's a jack boy. You go up to him. This is after your life got sorted out? Yes, I was, I was talking on the phone with him, and um, I'm always worried about him because I, I know how dangerous what he does. And so I was just telling him, you know, I, I love him, and just be careful. And he was like, man, I'm, I'm good. I stay prayed up. I'm, I'm fine. My grandma stay praying for me. I stay prayed up. <laughs> so not only did you live in a world within a world here in Clearwater, there was this pseudo false deception of Christianity 
that all the guys you ran with, they all thought they were Christians. Yeah, I would, I would, I would rob somebody, and you ask me the next day I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. And like you, you weren't just saying that to get somebody off your back who's trying to witness to you. No. You were fair income, honest to God, convinced you were a Christian. Yes. The Bible says that uh, we can't live that lifestyle and have been born again. And that, that's what religion does. Would you agree? That's what religion does. Definitely. Definitely. It sets up these rules, these regulations. If you walk somewhat within these rules and regulations, you're branded. That's it. You're a Christian. Is that your definition of a Christian today? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. So when you look back on the old Dre in the hood, gang banging and everything else you were doing, selling drugs to other people, were you a Christian? Not at all. You were lost. Definitely. So here's this guy. In this college, he's supposed to teach you how to do uh, panel beating and spraying cars, painting cars. And he starts telling you about Jesus. Yes. He what start, happened? He starts sharing his faith in class. And um, a couple times he shared his faith. And I, I know now how self-righteous I was thinking-wise. Because I remember always telling myself, hey, when I grow up and I get married and I get a job and I settle down, like if I do that... Then I started back going to church. And so I was like, hey, look at me. You know, I'm in school. I changed my life a little bit. I got out of the hood. I got out of the hood. I'm better. Yes. I, you know, I fixed me. I fixed it. Now I, need to go to, now I need to go start going to church because the only, thing I, the only thing I couldn't do was save myself from hell. So I needed God for that. But the rest, you know, I felt like I uh, had So did. you could fix yourself up, yes. pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Yes. But you couldn't necessarily get you out of hell. Yes. So for that bit, you went to church. Yes. <laughs> Dude, that is messed up. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, you started going to church. What happened? So I went to a church, um, and what, what I knew about church was, you know, you had to dress up and be fancy and this. So I put on some slacks, a tie, and I walk into this majority white church of a bunch of people in jeans and T-shirts. And I was like, I'm completely overdressed. Why? You know, and um, it, was my, it was probably my second time since I was 12 years old walking into a church because every time I went in church, I, I couldn't, I could not. I could not not go to the altar. I could not not cry um, because I just felt like if you people only knew who just walked into the room, you know, I just felt like I was just the worst person in the world. And so I know I just felt like God doesn't love me. You know, there's no way that I'm being here. And I always wanted to turn around and run out of the church. And so I just like I always do, I get in the church and I'm in the back and I go, I go to the altar and start bawling, um, just just crying. And um, the co-pastor pulled me over to the side and uh, went and speaking to my life, talking to me, and um, he went to ask me some questions that changed my perspective and recognizing my need for a savior, because despite of everything I just told you, I always felt like I was a good person. I did. I always felt like I was a good person. I'd get somebody clothes off my back and all these things. You know, I got a good heart, kind-hearted person. I felt like I was a so good person. So in other person. words, you wouldn't put a gun to the head of a friend. No. So you were a good person. Yes. I thought, you know, I'll rob a drug dealer, but I won't rob an old lady, and that makes me a good person. <laughs> I'm going to go get me a gray-haired wig <laughs> and a little cane so I'm safe when I walk the streets of Clearwater. <laughs> Do they all think like that? No, no. no but so, you, so you, you're saying you had this soft spot that... Yeah. I cry when I watch rom-coms, even as a thug. You cried when you watch what? Rom-coms, even as a thug. I never told anybody that, though. What, what's? A rom-com. What's, what's a rom-com? <laughs> Is the white coming out in me again? <laughs> like a romantic comedy? Oh, dude, talk English. <laughs> hey, we don't talk Ebonics. <laughs> You're supposed to be half part Italian. Talk like a Guido. <laughs> Dude, how am I supposed to understand rom-com? <laughs> I don't do Ebonics. Rom-com. 
Who knew what he was talking about? Look oh, at that. See? <laughs> I love you, man. Love you so, You're a good guy. I love you. So, so you would cry when you watched rom-coms? Yeah, and in the dog. It just channels. don't feel right even saying it, rom-com. <laughs> <laughs> So you would cry even for stuff like that. You know, you know what's amazing? Here you were so messed up, so beat up, so spat on, so chewed up, so molested and mutilated. But the little boy inside of you never died. No. And you, you know, Dre, that's really true most people. It doesn't matter how mean we are, how ugly we are, how screwed up we are. Nobody knows our stories. And uh, there's always someone deep down inside, no matter how much he's hating everybody else, he really wants somebody to love him. He just can't believe anybody would love him. You know? And, uh, but you know what I love about this gospel? You know what I love about this God? What I love about God became flesh and came to earth. He doesn't read the headlines. He doesn't yes. read what was just on the news about your gang or about you. He doesn't read you from the outside. He doesn't read your color. He doesn't read, and I said it just playfully, dude, but he doesn't read your language. He reads the heart. Yes. He knows you. And I love that about God. Some people, you know, want to fool God and try to dress up and look like they got it all together and they're educated and they're this and they got the money and they got the car and, you know, it looks like they're just doing it right. But even that guy, whether he's white or black, he's got a good job, he's got an education, he's got the money, he's got the Mercedes Benz, but he's still screwed up on the inside without yes. Jesus. Yes. And no one can read the truth about us like God can. And what I love about God is he knows the ugly in me, but he also knows the broken in me. And he loves us. And for those of you out there who maybe have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, it doesn't matter how much ugly there is. God can love us and does love us Amen. because he sees the brokenness, he sees the pain, and he sees the hurt. In a moment, you're going to have the opportunity to ask Jesus Christ in your heart. And I want you to know beyond a shadow of doubt, nobody can be too bad for a God who is way too good. Amen. Amen. The good of God can outdo any level of bad. So you, you started to have this encounter. He has this talk to you. What happens then? Um, so he, like I got to say he asked me, did I feel like I was a good person? I told him, yeah. Then he went to asking me, have you ever did this? You ever did that? Going through these lists of things. And when he got done... I knew that I wasn't a good person as I thought I was. <laughs> and I reckon I knew right then in that moment my need to be saved from myself. Yeah. Um, and so for the next couple months, I, um, I was at his house all the time. He was there for me. He was, she, I was going to Bible studies. I was reading his word. I was going, I was going to school and everything was going well. I was actually had a 4.0 in school, doing good. Yeah. <laughs> Not bad for a special ed student, right? Just goes to show, you know, we, we label people. Don't label people. Speak up to who they can be in Christ. 4.0, that's awesome, dude. Awesome. Keep going. And so um, this was 2011. Mm -hmm. So come December 2011, three months into school, I get a phone call. Um, I, had a, I had a daughter at the time. Um, back in Clearwater, and um, she was about two, I want to say. Um, she, she was two, and I found out someone tried to sexually molest her. 
So somebody tried to sexually molest her. Yes. And that must have caused everything inside of you to light up because you know what you went through. Yeah, it was... It, it, it really crushed me, you know, because I know how it is to be sexually abused. And um, I was trying to get my life together so I can be a good father, you know, but I wasn't there. And I should have been there. And I felt like I should have been there. And so I was just going to go back to Clearwater and just kill that guy. Every intention. I was going to kill him as soon as I got there. No talking. Because he qualified. Yes. On your list, he qualified as somebody that deserves to die. Yes. And you went back to Clearwater? Yes. What happened? I went back to Clearwater, but when I got there, he had already confessed um, to doing it. Um, some, he confessed as soon as it happened to the cops, and he was in jail. Um, and so I got back there, and it was the day I got back, it was like I never left. The same day I got back, my phone went to ringing. And I was, I was selling drugs and doing drugs and back in the streets like I never left. Come, to, come New Year's Eve, I checked myself in the hospital because my heart was pounding too fast. And I wasn't sure if I was going to, you know, if I was going to overdose on cocaine or something. And so I checked myself into the hospital. Um, at the time, at this time, my girlfriend who I was with um, was like 15 days from going to labor. And so... She, she was 15 days away from going into labor. Yes. Wow. Yes. And so I, um, she told me, you know, I needed to change. I needed to do something different. And so um, I told her I'd go back to Houston, and my pastor told me about a rehab, and I should go check myself into this rehab and try to get, you know, straight. And um, it, was, it was weird because, you know, where I come from, we're not addicts. You know, you, everybody pop pills. Everybody snort coke. Everybody do drugs, but you're not an addict. Addicts are people who walk the streets smoking crack. You know, that was my perception. You know, that's what I perceived, you know. Dude, you had a messed up perception. <laughs> yes. yes. I mean, on every level. But that was your world. Yes. Well, I mean, you, that's what you saw as normal. Yes. When, you, when, you, when you're selling drugs and you're, and you're making money and you're doing drugs, you don't necessarily classify yourself as an addict because you're not. An addict is somebody that's broke, bummy, walking the streets, have nothing. You so know. the guy who's always buying the drugs and not selling it, he's the addict. Yes. You ain't the addict because you sell them and use them. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're all messed up. Amen. All of us, hey? Yes. So do you go back to Houston? I go back you to go Houston. You go back to Houston, and then you ended up in a drug rehab in Louisiana. Yes. Tell me about that. What happened? How I got there? Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I, I go to the rehab in Houston first. First time I opened the Bible up for the first time, and um, Jesus became real to me for the first time. And this is when um, I felt God telling me to finally share at 24, 25 years old that I was sexually abused. And um, I shared it in a room full of men, and I had um, probably one of the toughest things I have had to do is share that, but I shared it in like seven men from 18 to 60 came to me privately afterwards and said that they've been sexually abused. And Seven they, men came to you and said they've been sexually yeah, abused. Yeah, and that they was, I was the first and last person to ever tell. The first and the last. They ain't telling anybody yeah. else. And so I, I, knew, I, knew how, I knew how much pain and, and hurt that caused me for my years. I couldn't imagine have, carrying that that far. And so um, I, I go there and I, ch I check out of that rehab in three months. My girlfriend comes back. And we start, you know, raising our family for about a year and a half. Um, I, was, I was sober. I was going to church. But I had one foot kind of in the church and one foot in the world, in a sense, because my identity. I didn't know. I, at the point, I, when I was in there, I didn't get the identity part of Jesus yet. I didn't know. Um, so it was a Christian rehab? Yes. Okay. Yes, but I, I checked out, like, earlier than my graduation date. I just, I, I, I was all about me at the time still, like, I'm on a different program than what y'all on. Me and God on a different program, you know. This is nine months, me and God on three months. And so I checked myself out. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, I, I had arrived, I got it, you know. And so um, for a year and a half, I was doing good in everything's world, but um, I immediately started getting prideful and arrogant and really feeling like um, it was too much love for me. My, my pastor and the people at the church, they, they loved me too much. Um, I've, I've never experienced love like that. I've never experienced somebody 
keeping me accountable, somebody checking on me, calling me, and making sure that I'm okay. Um, and wow. I just wanted to run from that. Um, it, was, it was too much. I, I, I never felt like I deserved love, and I didn't know what love was. And Thank God for good churches. Yes. yes. Thank God for good men of God. Yes. And, the- and so um, within us, um, I didn't... I didn't want to give up. The reason I so I, I fell and lost everything. To make a long story short, um, and when, after I did that, I ended up my pastor ended up asking me to go to you know another rehab. And at the time of going to this new rehab, I found out that my girlfriend was pregnant again. And so she went back to Florida, while I went to Louisiana to another rehab. And um, in this rehab is when I found my identity in Christ. And I learned about my identity in Christ. And I learned what grace was and what mercy was. And I, I've heard these words being tossed around my whole life. And I never knew what it meant. I never knew that God wanted a relationship with me. And so when I got there and I realized my identity was in Christ and God started showing that to me, I realized why I fell and what happened. And it was because the streets was my identity. You know, uh, everything that came along with that lifestyle, the the way people see me, the way they looked at me, the way they viewed me, um, that was my identity. And the streets, in a sense, made me who I was. So if I'm getting this right, you have this experience with Jesus, and it was genuine, it was real. You go through this Christian rehab center, but you didn't catch or they didn't convey as clearly, whichever it was, that you're a new creation, All you understood was, okay, my sins are forgiven. You go to this second rehab, and now you start to get who you are in Christ. You're not just a sinner saved by grace. You're a new person. Yes. So, in other words, before you were living like, well, I'm a sinner, I'm forgiven, I'm saved by grace, let me try not to sin now, this second time around, you get the revelation, and a lot of Christians don't get this revelation, of who you are in Christ, and instead of trying not to live who you were, now you're living out of this new person that you understand you are. Yes, I Did I sum that up correctly? Yes, I understood that. Being a follower of Jesus is not what I do. It's who I am. It's who you are. Yes. So is it just Christian religion that will change a person? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So people could go to church, Christian church. Are they necessarily saved? No. What, what is the difference from just going to church. I mean, like I said, when I say I opened the Bible, I can I can go to church every day, and I can hear a pastor preach an amazing message. But one thing that pastor can't do is give me a relationship with Jesus Christ. He can't do that. Awesome. Awesome. How many how many years clean are you now? Six. Six years clean. You went from being abandoned to abused, confused, molested, labeled special ed, the possibility of a scholarship or part scholarship taken away for you because you don't qualify. The only person who validated you was a drug dealer who wanted you to work for him. And here you are now. You get born again, filled with the Holy Ghost. You find out who you are because Jesus lives in you. You're a whole new person. And now, what do you do for a living? Um, I I teach cognitive behavior at a jail, and I'm a Louisiana sheriff deputy. A sheriff deputy. Deputy sheriff. Come on, everybody, stand and give him a standing ovation. This is what Jesus can do. This is what Jesus can do. I love you, man. 
Yeah. Awesome. Amen. Awesome. Amen. So proud of you. You, you have a rap song you're going to sing for us. Yes. What's it called? Relationship, not religion. Relationship, not religion. Take it away, Dre. Hey. You know, so many times we get caught up in religion that we miss the fact that God wants a relationship with us. Yeah, you know, Zedek, I want to ask you a question. What's, what's your education? What's, what's your, your vocation? vocation? What's your foundation? What's your denomination? Cause mine Jesus, mine Jesus, mine Jesus, mine Jesus. He want relationship and not religion. 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 You know I'm running for the king like a politician. Sacrificing everything, call it true religion. Knocking down stereotypes, call it demolition. I'm trying to paint a perfect picture like a Mona Lisa. I'm only here for a while, like a student visa. I ain't trying to win them over, not a people pleaser. Introduce them to the king, who? King Jesus. See everybody, everybody talking about religion, but it never lined up with the way they living. They falling short the condemnation, then they start repenting, but then they focus on. Talking down on them, bum, just, just venting. Hey, so, so what's your education? What's your vocation? What's your foundation? What's your denomination? Cause my Jesus, hey, my Jesus, hey, my Jesus, hey, my Jesus. He want relationship and not religion. He want relationship and not religion. Hey, he want relationship and not religion. He want relationship and not religion. Hey. So what's your education? What's your vocation? What's your foundation? What's your denomination? Hey. hey listen, 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 man. When the beat drop, I want you to bounce with oh, me. What's hey. Listen. Too many people perpetrate in front and like they know my God. They get in front of unbelievers, they don't know my God. But when that pressure starts cooking, they like, oh my God. See, everybody want the blessings, but not the rod. They say that faith without works is truly dead. That's why my words flowing through me from the Godhead. I'm praying that they see the light, I hope that God made. Because your works don't mean none unless they got led. They telling me to pipe down too hard on them. I'm trying to free them from the ones with the law on them. They telling me to pipe down too hard on them. I'm just trying to free them. I'm just trying to free them. What's your vocation? What's your foundation? What's your denomination? Cause my Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus. My Jesus, listen, he want relationship and not religion. 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 Hey, hey, hey. What's your education? What's your vocation? What's your foundation? What's your denomination? Cause my Jesus. Love you, man. Come on, let's all stand. You know, Dre, I, I, while Christ is God's answer to the world, the enemy knows how to take the perfect plan and try to make it something different. And religion has become a counterfeit 
that isn't what God ever designed or God ever intended. You can be religious. You can go to church. You can do all the things religiously correct and your heart be far, far, far from God. A religious teacher came to Jesus one time. He didn't really want to be seen with Jesus because Jesus wasn't always popular in the religious world. He had the problem of telling things the way they were. And religious people don't always like that. And he said, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I respect that you're a religious leader in our community. But even you, you must be born again. Look, it isn't about who's good enough. It's not about who was born on the right side of the street or the wrong side of the street. (laughs) I don't think our lives could be more different how I started and how you started I thank God that I didn't go through the crap that you had to go through but I needed Jesus I grew up in a preacher's home my mom was a good lady but I needed Jesus I was broken I was messed up in my own way and I love the fact that it's not about the color of skin or where we come from it's about the fact that we all we all are damaged goods and only God through Jesus Christ can get to the broken in us and fix us and I am so glad he got me and I'm so glad he got you because now my distant brother (laughs) is my brother in Christ We, we, we come up with so many screwed up religious concepts It's not about whether or not you're good enough and it's not about whether or not you can be good enough. It's about will you believe that the creator of this universe actually cares enough that when this whole thing spun out of control that he was willing to become one of us and take a bullet for us because that's exactly what Jesus did. He died the agonizing death that every one of us deserved because of our own mistakes. You see, while we're all broken, you know what broken people do? They break other people. We're messed up, and so we act out messed up. And so even though we've been victims, we've been perpetrators too. We all are. That's the truth that we've got to come to. Just like, you know, you said, I was a good person. I, I, I thought I was a good person. I'm gangbanging and, you know, we're near killing everybody, and, but I was a good person. And the reality is that we have to see that our brokenness makes us act like broken people. And we end up hurting other people too. And so to be born again is to realize the truth about where we're at. We need help. And to realize that God so loved every one of us. Black and from the hood to white and born in a Christian home. But we need a Savior. We need a Jesus. God so loved the world that whatever you were born into, or whatever you chose to walk into, whatever lifestyle, whatever your past or maybe even your present is, 
if you will accept that God so loves you, if you could accept that God loves you, then you could turn around and say, you know what, I'm willing to love Him. And being born again, it's in a second shot, get born into the nature and the character of Jesus Christ, God who came in the flesh. That's our salvation. Not a salvation of trying to be good enough, a salvation of the Creator coming back in us and changing us from the inside. Not just forgiving us, changing us from the inside. You know, I just had a funny thought. Uh, here I am in the middle of a, an altar call. I'm going to be really honest. He came inside you and changed you from the inside. And he still left you black. You know why? Because to him, black is just beautiful. We live in a crazy world, and we got to get uncrazy. And Jesus is the one who can get us uncrazy. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's come down here. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized as a baby. I don't want to disappoint you, but honestly, that's, that's irrelevant. That's not a decision you made. I'm not asking you if you're good enough. I'm not asking you if you're good or you're bad. You might think you're good, and maybe you are. What I am asking you is God loves you and took a bullet, the bullet for you. Now will you love him and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Every eye closed. And before we leave this place, you didn't just come to hear a story. That may be why you came. But why God brought you here today is because God is yearning wanting desperately to live life inside of you. Inside of you. He who dwells in the heavens wants to live life inside of you. And no one can give you a clean start, a fresh start, a new start like Jesus can. And so right across this auditorium today, if you're willing to say yes to Jesus, I'm not asking you to join my church. I already told you, grace and faith can blow away. The only name that's going to last forever is the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. But I am asking you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Jesus said no one can come to the Father unless they come through me because I'm the one who can make you whole. So right across this auditorium, as eyes are closed, if the Spirit of God is talking to you, if something's tugging at you, if you know, if you want, if something is urging you, don't fight it. Don't fight it. Don't fight it. You win this fight by actually putting yourself in Jesus' hands. If you want to accept Jesus Christ right now, come on, put your hand up all across this auditorium. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, put your hand up nice and high. Thank you, ma'am. I see that hand. God bless you. You put it down. Thank you, ma'am. I see that hand. You can put it down. Thank you, sir. Up the back there on my right, I see your hand. You can put it down. Who else? Come on. There are people. I know there are a lot more people ready to ask Jesus in their heart. That's about four people right now. But God's talking to you. 
You don't have to be from the hood. You don't have to have been gang banging. You could have been from a white family like mine, born into a, a Christian home. Everyone must be born again. Every one of us have been stained and messed up by life. And every one of us needs Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you all to do something very, very respectfully, gently, honestly, sincerely, softly. Turn to the person next to you and ask them, would you like to ask Jesus in your heart? Come on. Why don't you accept Jesus? And then offer to come on down the front with them. Start bringing them down the front. Turn to the person next to you. Be polite. Be gentle. Be nice. Ask them. And those of you that raised your hand, together with my, my workers, people like Pastor Jan and Paul and others, start to come on down the front. That's right. Step out. Come on down. Here they come. Come on. If you raised your hand, come on down. I want to pray with you. Come on. That's it. Good girl. Come on down. I want to pray with you. Those of you that raised your hand, good on you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just face. You could face that way. Just face that way. Thank you. Thank you. There were others. Just step out of the aisle. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. Come on down. Come on. If you raise your hand, I want to pray with you and lead you to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. 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 Why don't you come stand here in front of Dre, in front of me. Thank you, buddy. What's your name? Angel. Angel. That's a good name. What's your name? Joyce. Joyce. Good on you, Joyce. That's a good name, too. God bless you. I see you came with Jan and Jeanette. Awesome. Thank you. God bless you. I'm going to ask you guys to pray with me. And we're going to say a prayer, something to this effect. God, I realize that I've made mistakes. You ever made any mistakes, Joyce? I made a whole ton. Don't ask me how many. I lost count a long time ago. I've sinned. I've done wrong stuff. You ever make a mistake, angel? Yeah. I'm going to get you to repeat after me something to the effect, God, I I believe you love me. Don't always understand why I believe you love me. I've sinned. I've made mistakes. Jesus Christ, I'm asking you to come into my heart. Is that what you're getting today? Is that what you're feeling like doing? Good girl. Is that what you want to do? Good on you, angel good angel. This is a good angel. (laughs) I want everyone to repeat after me right now. And those of you, Joyce and Angel, repeat after me. Yeah, come on. Come on, Drake. Come in here. Everyone repeat after me. Dear God, God, I believe you love me. I believe you you care about me. I believe you you became flesh. And you died on that cross for me. Jesus Christ, I welcome you. Come into my heart right now. I want you to live inside me. Forgive me of all my mistakes. I've made I've made sins. I made sins. I've asked you to forgive me. I ask you to forgive I me. want you to live in me, Jesus. I want you to live in me, Take Jesus. over my life. Take over my life. And I thank you right now. And I thank you right now. Father God, I thank you. Father God, I thank that you. That you hear me. And you're answering me. And you're answering me. And right now, right, right now Jesus Christ is coming to live in my heart. Amen. I receive it. I receive it. (laughs) My sins are forgiven. And Jesus lives in me. Amen. Now I'm going to pray. Dre and I are going to pray over you for a moment. I want everyone to just reach your hands this way. And uh, we're just going to pray for you guys.
Amen. God is good. God is great. Amen. Give them a big hand. Come on, give them a big hand.